Good evening, and thank you for such a warm welcome. Um, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here speaking with you all. Um, right here, I do have my uh, my logo with my motto, and I actually think it fits perfectly with the topic of discussion tonight, um, loving the skin that you're in. Uh, my motto for cardinal plastic surgery is where you are the standard of beauty. Um, and I think that is so appropriate in a time where there's this thought that there's just one particular cookie cutter, you know, aspect of beauty. Um, but I think it's so important for every person to find at least one thing that you find beautiful about yourself. Um, and particularly when we have this discussion about breast cancer, um, which again, challenges our body image, our mental views and physical views of ourselves. So I always start off any conversation that has to do with me being involved, a plastic surgeon, with what exactly plastic surgery is. There are so many misconceptions. Um, I've had patients that are newly diagnosed with breast cancer. They're referred to my office and they have no idea why they're there. Um, there's always this thought that it has to do with solely cosmetic. And so in this context of breast cancer, a lot of women then think anything that's being done to them by a plastic surgeon is cosmetic and therefore vain. And I really want to take this time to educate the people that are on this um, webinar about truly the purpose of plastic surgery in this context. So plastic surgery is derived from the Greek word plastikos, which means to form or to mold. So even in its earliest context, it was reconstructive. Um, in the medieval times, if someone stole or was a thief, the way that they kind of publicly shamed them, you know, would be to cut off their nose so everybody knew who they were dealing with. And that is socially isolating. And so the role of a plastic surgeon then was to try to reconstruct a nose so you can bring people back into the fold. Again, social isolation is devastating. And we know that from a lot of the work with cleft lip and palates in a lot of um, uh, countries where medical care is not as accessible. The different breakdown of the categories within the field of plastic surgery are listed here. We have uh, fellowships having to do with breast, cosmetics, craniofacial, hand surgery, and microsurgery. So plastic surgery is all-encompassing, cosmetic and reconstructive. Reconstructive meaning that it is insurance-based and it is deemed medically necessary, okay? Um, the goal of plastic surgery, when we talk about breast cancer patients is to restore form and function. It's to recreate the image of a breast. We can't uh, recreate the actual gland, which you know produces milk, um, but the goal is to give the appearance of a breast. So why are we even talking about this? My, one of my passions is educating people and with that education, them being empowered to speak up for themselves, ask the hard questions, um, not stop until they get the right questions answered from the appropriate people. Um, goal number one is to know your rights. A lot of times patients really don't know what, uh, what their options are. You assume that based on the information that's been provided to you, that that's it. Um, if a breast surgeon does not mention anything about reconstruction, you just assume that that's not an option or on the table for you. So part of knowing your rights is number one, knowing the law. There was a law passed in 1998 called the Women's Health Care and Cancer Rights Act. And basically the background of this law was there was a young woman who was diagnosed with a very aggressive breast cancer. Um, she was supposed to have her mastectomies and she was referred to a plastic surgeon, surgeon for reconstruction. When they sent prior authorization 
request to the insurance company for breast reconstruction, the medical director said, and I've quoted it here, replacement of the breast is not medically necessary. This is not a bodily function and therefore cannot and should not be replaced. We will get into why that is a horrible statement in a little bit. Basically, the plastic surgeon did not deem that to be acceptable. Um, and there was a lot of um, advocacy and protests. And this law was actually passed um, with the help of President Bill Clinton. Next slide. And so what this law basically states that insurance has to cover any surgery having to do with the reconstruction of the breast that was diagnosed with breast cancer, um, any symmetry procedures. So if you decide to have a mastectomy on one side and don't want anything done to the other side, if you need to have a breast lift or breast reduction, that is covered. Um, any complications having to do with uh, your breast cancer treatment. So if you have to have the lymph nodes taken out of your um, underarm and you have the swelling or lymphedema afterwards, treatment has to be covered by your insurance. That is forever and ever. There is no expiration on that. Probably the most common thing that I've come across is if you have your insurance through your employer, they very well may have you on a plan that may not cover that. They just have to change the plan. So you can submit for prior authorization to see if that uh, reconstruction or whatever procedure is gonna be covered and they will deny it. And they will say, the employer's plan does not cover it. Talk to your employer, have them change the plan, it's covered. Point being, it is covered. So never take no for an answer. Um, again, me as a plastic surgeon, my goal and probably my everyday battle is um, holding insurance companies accountable because that's, that's unacceptable. Next slide. So point two, why are we talking about this? It's for you to be informed to make the best decision for you. I come across so many women who were never offered breast reconstruction, didn't know their full options. Um, and when you look at the statistics on this slide, that less than 50% of people requiring mastectomies or even offered reconstruction, I want you to substitute the word reconstruction with restoration. So less than 50% of the people that undergo mastectomies are offered restoration. And when we talk about breast reconstruction and probably the most common um, things that I do have to do with the breasts, so breast reconstructions and breast reductions, the value of a woman's breasts again, is a women's health and women's rights uh, issue. It's trying to advocate for the validity of restoration and for that to be in whatever realm, and we will get into the options uh, in a few slides, but to deny someone restoration, again, that's horrific and unethical. Only 15 to 24% of people undergoing immediate breast reconstruction, meaning that at the time of their mastectomy or mastectomies, removal of their breasts, actually um, there's only 15 to 24% of people that underwent uh, immediate breast reconstruction. They were young, they were insured, and they were white women. So you have whole categories and populations of people that aren't offered reconstruction um, for whatever reason, whether the physicians are making that decision for them, taking away their choice and their options and what they want to do that's right for them or what they feel is right for them. Uh, next slide. Oh, actually there is a poll 
um, that popped up, offered reconstruction. They wanna know how many of you were actually offered reconstruction. And I can't tell you again, how many um, women I come across, even that have had their cancers addressed in the last you know, five to 10 years. So 10 years after the Women's Health Care and uh, Breast Cancer Act, that people still aren't being, being offered and given that opportunity to have the reconstruction that they want. I'm gonna close this poll out. So we talked about who actually gets the immediate breast reconstructions. Um, so this poll, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be reading what the uh, results were, but it says that 79% of the people on this webinar were actually offered reconstruction. 21% were not offered reconstruction. Um, I will get into the um, factors that affect reconstruction options um, in the next few slides. Um, but we've talked about the patients that actually get offered immediate reconstruction. So let's talk about the people that do not and where the disparities lie. So usually women that are older, um, greater than 65 years of age, um, so low socioeconomic status, um, insurance, so uninsured, and then the big thing, which is, again, why one of my passions is educating people, is awareness. So everyone on this webinar, now that you know it, help a friend, a family member, somebody else, and educate people. Because the more people are educated, the more options and um, treatment and restoration will be uh, provided. So African-American women and Asian women are third as likely to undergo reconstruction compared to white women. Again, access to information, insurance, and language assistance, um, particularly with the demographics of our communities where you have larger populations that may not speak English, that then you have another barrier where if people do not feel it's important to um, be sure to communicate effectively what all of the options are, you have a missed opportunity. And again, laziness, which, which is basically what it is, keeps people from offering and educating people about their full um, options when it comes to breast cancer treatment and care. And then the reconstruction rates are here. So you have 56% um, of white women having reconstruction, 41% of Asian women, and 38% of African-American women. Now, I do need to make a caveat here. Um, I've had this discussion with um, some other Black surgeons, Black female surgeons that care for breast cancer patients, um, where there's a lot of variables, particularly, again, we know um, we're familiar with Black women in our communities being the center of the communities, being the um, caregivers, uh, providing so much care, home life, um, support for children and the elderly. And one of the things that we've noticed is in this time of need, when you have been diagnosed with breast cancer, there is such a delay when black women want to take care of everybody else, make sure everybody else is set. This is time for everybody to start taking care of you. Um, and I think that is something that is inherently in us as women to try to provide and take care of everybody else and not know when it's that time to step back and let other people take care of us. So this is an interesting slide. Um, in New York, they implemented a law called the Breast Cancer Provider Discussion Law. And what it did is it mandated providers, um, breast surgeons, to refer to plastic surgeons for reconstruction patients that have been diagnosed with breast cancer. 
Um, the most significant factors affecting reconstruction rates, just like we were talking about in the previous slides with some of the disparities that we see in breast reconstruction patients, is that there um, is no mandated discussion talking about that insurance actually is going to cover this. So again, a lot of people's fear is that reconstruction, because it's a plastic surgeon doing it, it's going to be cosmetic, meaning that insurance is going to pay for it. It's going to come out of my pocket. Um, then the second uh, significant factor was expedient plastic surgery referral. Um, again, giving people the tools to make the right decisions has to do with getting them to the people that can give them that information. When they mandated uh, referrals to plastic surgeons for reconstruction, there was an increase in the reconstruction rates across income levels, which again, we said before, socioeconomic status, um, lower socioeconomic status saw less reconstructive rates, and then an increase in reconstruction in African-Americans and the elderly. People were given the options. For some reason, in the elderly, just like, again, with these beauty standards, the older you are, suddenly you're less attractive and it's less important for you to have, again, restoration of your body despite a, a breast cancer diagnosis. The third reason why we're talking about this is to dispel the misconceptions of plastic surgery. So again, I mentioned it before, um, cosmetic surgery is probably the thing that people think of most. Breast augmentations, liposuction, Brazilian butt lifts, BBLs, all that kind of stuff. Plastic surgery is to help again in this restoration process. So when we talk about your breast reconstruction options, um, and I know this is probably the part that a lot of people um, want to uh, learn about. The biggest thing that I stress with patients that see me is that you lose absolutely nothing by waiting to do a reconstruction. You've just gotten a diagnosis. You could be going through chemotherapy. Um, and there's so much that you're thinking about that's going on in your mind. And to think that you feel rushed to come up with, okay, how do I want my breast to look afterwards? I just want the cancer out. I see a spectrum of patients of just wanting to get the cancer out. I don't care about breast reconstruction, what I look like afterwards, or patients that are like, you know what, when I wake up, I want to know that this process has started. But the big thing I want people to know, you can take as much time as you want to figure out what kind of reconstruction you want. There are no bridges that are burned by waiting. And to be perfectly honest, when we see patients uh, for the reconstructive options and you haven't had the full cancer treatment, there are so many unknowns. We don't know if you're gonna need radiation therapy afterwards, which again, affects your reconstructive options. Um, so you can take as much time and do not let anybody stress and pressure you into making that decision. So here we've got some reconstructive options. You can do flat closure. There is, again, this push for surgeons and physicians to make that decision for you. Like, oh, you don't want a flat closure. It is your body. You can do whatever you want to do with it. Okay. And even if you had a flat closure, that does not mean you can't have a reconstruction in the future. There are no bridges that are burned. Okay. Um, immediate versus delayed. Immediate means that we are starting the reconstruction right when your mastectomy or mastectomies occurs, whether that's putting tissue expanders in or um, putting implants in, okay? There are sometimes when it comes to using your own tissue, that is something that happens in a delayed fashion where it's not done at that time because the length of the surgery is a lot longer, okay? Delayed reconstruction means that you're not having anything done at the time of the mastectomies, you're waiting. Um, implant-based versus autologous. Autologous is just using your own tissue. 
So there are staged procedures and there's a lot, again, there's tons of variables, the size of your breasts, the expected treatments after surgery. So if they know going in that you're going to have radiation therapy, we're not going to be doing, you know, we might put tissue expanders in just as placeholders, but we're not going to do any expansion or anything until we, you've finished radiation therapy and we know how your tissue has responded to it. So stage procedures, whether it's tissue expander, um, implant placement, or tissue expander, use of your own tissue, um, pain and recovery between implant-based reconstruction and autologous. So the pain is very different for all of these. Um, the biggest thing I can say when it comes to using your own tissue is now you don't have either one or two um, surgery sites. You have that plus wherever they've gotten the tissue from. So there's more pain and suffering up front just because with the amount of area on your body that has been operated on. The long-term outcomes, people are a lot more happy with the long-term outcomes of using their own tissue, mainly because typically there's not a lot of revisions that need to be done. Revisions are kind of little corrections to get things um, better placed and more, uh, I guess, aesthetically pleasing. But I want to stress again, that is not cosmetic. Insurance will pay for that. So whatever your concerns are, five years, 10 years down the road, you can have that address if things change and shift. Um, factors affecting reconstructive options. So you are a whole individual. You've got medical conditions, you've got allergies, you've got previous surgeries, and all of those things combined are factors um, that give us the options for your reconstruction. So if you've had huge abdominal surgeries, most likely using your own tissue for um, reconstruction, at least in the abdomen, is probably out of the question. So there's a lot of things and questions that um, your, your plastic surgeon will ask you to really be able to determine not only with the goals that you have, but looking at your whole medical history to see what are some of the options that you have for your reconstruction. Um, and again, are you gonna need chemotherapy afterwards? Are you gonna need radiation therapy? Those are all things that really guide us in what the reconstructive options are. And the last part, but this is n by no means an insignificant part, is the importance of how breast cancer and the surgeries and the treatments involved affect your whole body. You are, again, a whole person. So your physical aspect, psychologically, your social aspect, your intimacy, those are all significant and affected when you undergo cancer treat, breast cancer treatment. <sighs> When I initially, when I was in residency and I learned about the, um, the Women's uh, Healthcare and Breast Cancer Act um, and the idea that breasts were important, that really didn't make sense to me because as a person who identifies as a woman and the one of your first memories in what elementary school is who started wearing a training bra first. That is a very foundational part of your identity as a woman and a young girl going into womanhood. Um, the idea that breasts are only meant to be sexualized for someone else, but not for me that just doesn't make sense. So the idea that someone would say that it's not important, it's, it symbolizes womanhood. You know, if you get the right dress or the right bra to get the girls popping, like that's a huge part of how you see yourself and view yourself as a mother, someone who's breastfed their children, fitting into clothes. 
um, your relationship with your partners, the fact that that would be minimized so much just shows us how far we do have to go in um, women's health care and women's rights. Um, I wanted to end with this quote, and it's always so funny because, you know, whoever writes history gets to say whatever they want, but apparently this is the Italian plat father of plastic surgery. There's an Indian one. I'm hoping at some point in time, I will be able to find an African one. Um, but this is a quote that I remember um, reading and is very foundational in plastic surgery, where it really talks about the crux of why we do what we do. We restore, rebuild, and make whole those parts which nature hath given, but which forth fortune has taken away. Not so much as to delight the eye, but rather to buoy up the spirit and help the mind of the afflicted. So the final points again, all that was overwhelming and there was a lot of information there. The biggest thing I want people to understand is to be educated and to know their rights so that then you can be an advocate for yourself and for others. When we talk about breasts, and women's health, this is, a, this is a rights issue. And all of us, once you hear it, you are now responsible for it. So I really wanna thank everybody and thank um, the Living Beyond Breast Cancer organization for uh, inviting me to talk. And I pray that um, you all are empowered by this information. Thank you. Hey, Erica, thank you so much for being with us. We're really looking forward to what you have to say and when you share your story with us. Um, and after we hear from Erica, we will invite Dr. Stevenson back on the screen to take your questions. So don't forget to use the Q&A feature on your screen. Erica, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me living beyond breast cancer. Dr. Stevenson, that was phenomenal. And I'm actually coming up on almost 10 years of having my double mastectomy and reconstructive surgery. So it's probably time for me to check back in with someone <laughs> about what I need to do with these implants. So I would love, I also would love to just have a black plastic surgeon that is so, so tight. But anyway, my name is Erica Hart. <laughs> I'll hit you up. <laughs> my name is Erica Hart. My pronouns are she and they. I am black, a descendant of the transatlantic slave trade. I say that to honor my ancestors and to really make it clear what my politic is, how my life has been informed um, in this world by what's been passed down to me traumatically, but also what's been passed down to me uh, spiritually and culturally. Um, I am queer. That's how I love. That's also my politic. I am a non-binary femme. I don't identify as a woman or a lady. I am a breast cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2014, May 2014, about four months before I was supposed to get married. I had a wedding dress picked out. Um, we had colors picked out, a venue. Everything was really about to, you know, when you're four months out from a wedding, everything is pretty much handled. And then we found out that I was going to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And it was pretty devastating and traumatic. I oftentimes get the question of what was it like? And it was, it was awful. You know, it was really, really challenging to deal with so many you know, thoughts that we are given through the media about breast cancer, but then also my own personal experiences with breast cancer. My mom um, passed away from breast cancer when I was 13 years old. So that's what I was very much present to in that moment. And I was, I say sometimes that I was lucky um, that I was diagnosed in New York City because I found out actually in public in Wall Street and I fell apart. And the thing about New York is that nobody cares what anybody is doing pretty much ever. Um, so people just walked past me and didn't really bother me. And that's all that I needed. I needed that time to really sit with how my life was about to shift. And I had really no idea. 
Um, I went on to have chemotherapy. I did get married. I am now divorced. We can celebrate that. Divorce is really okay. Um, I'm a sexuality educator as well. So um, I talk about relationships and sex and race and gender um, and, the, and their intersections. So yes, we celebrate divorce 100%. A relationship ending is fantastic, especially that one. Um, so uh, I did get married though. And I got married on one of the like the highest dose of chemotherapy that stage was like six sessions where it was very very high um completely bald had a time of my life but I just really wasn't present um I felt fatigued I felt tired it was running on just adrenaline um and I also was experiencing vaginal dryness and a lower libido and I could not figure out why my oncologist handed me a book that was about this thick of all of the side effects for chemotherapy on my first day of chemo. And, you know, I'm sorting through it, but I'm not even as a sex educator, not even thinking, okay, what is going to be the impact on my sex life, right? Until I started to ask questions of how does chemo actually impact my, you know, my sex life, my sex drive, is that an impact? And I had my oncologist, um, nurses, uh, my breast cancer surgeon all look at me quite dumbfounded that I was even asking these questions. And I started to see that there is this relationship to people who live with chronic illnesses and disabilities as if that we are desexualized, as if we are no longer interested in any sort of pleasure, even if it is just pleasure for ourselves, let alone pleasure with a partner. All of my doctors knew that I was about to get married and that that was a really big part of my life, but none of them felt it necessary to actually incorporate a conversation around sex, a conversation around my body. Um, I also discovered with my breast cancer diagnosis, how often it's gendered that people with breast cancer are women and I don't identify as a woman. So I just felt very much pushed out of the conversation. I, I'm black. At the time I was 24 years old. I was broke living paycheck to paycheck. And I was queer in you know, a relationship with a woman. And a, a lot of the narratives around breast cancer is a white woman who has a picket fence, uh, maybe a minivan, three kids and is her whole world is shattered because she's been diagnosed. And I, yes, similarly, my world felt like it was shattered, but I also just was in a completely different space. It was shattered for so many different reasons. How was I going to actually pay for any of what was going to be happening to me? At that time, I didn't even have health insurance. And I remember maybe like six months before I was diagnosed, my dad was urging me to get health insurance. And I was like, no, it's fine. I'm working part-time jobs. I can't really make that work. These part-time jobs don't offer it, right? We know the really um, the horrible ways in which health insurance is linked to your job, right? That should never be the case. Everybody should have access to health insurance, whether you're employed or not, but also if you're working part-time, you should have health insurance, but that's neither here nor there. Um, it's actually here and there. It's actually very much here. <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't have health insurance and thank God to Obamacare that I was able to get health insurance and actually work with my, you know, healthcare team to get chemotherapy, a double mastectomy, reconstructive surgery, um, and continue seeing my oncologist well after um, uh, Obamacare ended, if you will. So, um, or ended for me um, when I started working a bit more. Um, I, I, I think too, it's, it was kind of eye-opening for me to see sort of the reluctance that a lot of medical institutions had around me as a black person, but also at the other intersections of identity where I sit as a queer person, as a non-binary person, rarely was anyone asking me for my pronouns or checking in with how I wanted to relate to my chest. Um, 
I, you may have seen me topless on the internet because in 2016, I went topless at a prominent uh, music festival in Brooklyn where I showed my double mastectomy scars because when I Googled double mastectomy on a black person, I still got pictures of Angelina Jolie, right? And Angelina Jolie wasn't even topless, right? And, and a lot of the images were just white. And I really wanted to see what my scars were going to look like. So I asked my plastic surgeon, you know, what sort of images do you have of, you know, breast cancer survivors that have had double mastectomies? And it took her two weeks to find one image. So from that point, I knew that there was a uh, disparity there, right? Um, there's lots of statistics around Black people getting breast cancer and dying of it at faster rates than white people. But oftentimes those rates were talked about as if there's something genetically wrong with Black people uh, that gives us a proclivity to breast cancer, and that is not the case. Um, we, it's literally just social, um, and Dr. Stevenson touched on this as well, the lack of access to information about breast cancer, breast cancer advocacy, advocacy campaigns actually working to show us in, in images or in press or in commercials, right? Um, actually having mammograms done accurately, and there's quantifiable so much evidence that shows that mammograms are often done inac inadequately on black people. And that just shows the depths of medical racism within our systems. So I started to understand that and also within my own experiences, talk about the intersections of chronic illness, disability, sex, and medical racism as it's not just breast cancer where black people are impacted by the medical industrial complex. It is all of the ways in which our bodies come in contact with a structure that is built on experimenting on our bodies. And it's important for me to remind people who look like me, especially black, um, especially black queer and trans folks, because we are constantly erased um, in this space and rarely ever talked about. And that has a direct impact on how we relate to our bodies. So people ask me, you know, like, how do you, do you love your body after, you know, having a double mastectomy and having scars and your body looking different? How was that for you? And I think the question has to shift to how was it for me to have to constantly fight to see my body represented in something that everybody should be able to see themselves so that they can do the necessary steps to take care of them. Um, you know, walking into medical structures and really feeling like my body is not worthy of autonomy, um, is not worthy of actually being checked in with if you know I was in pain or if I had stress or if I was able to even afford the procedures that they were going to be doing, all of that had an impact on my body as I was worried about those things and unable to be present to what was going on with me. I think too, the focus oftentimes with breast cancer in particular is around beauty and um, feeling beautiful and pretty and I also do a lot of work in moving away from that, um, as I don't think that, that, like Dr. Stevenson said, our bodies exist for someone else. Um, and oftentimes conversations around beauty is hoping that other people see the beauty in us. And it's really beautiful that our bodies carried us to this point. Right. It's really beautiful that we get to continue to breathe air through our lungs and get to be loved on by our loved ones um, and get to be held by our children and our grandparents. Right. Like that is really beautiful. The aesthetic is so fleeting that oftentimes the focus is always there. And I'm always hoping that we get so much deeper uh, than that. Um, yeah, I think that that is the bit that I wanted to share. I'm sure I'm leaving things out. It's always hard to sum up your experience with breast cancer because it's it's traumatic. And with trauma, there's a memory loss. <laughs> so I'm sure the questions will gauge 
my memory a bit, but I'm so happy and honored to be invited here to speak. And I hope that if anything that I shared made a difference for you, then I am, then I am happy. Wow, thank you so much, Erica, for sharing your story. We'll have Dr. Stevenson to come on. Um, we have a lot of questions for you all. The, I see the Q&A is, is kind of running. I see the chatters going on. So, you know, you, you touched upon some great points, Erica, and I really want to just talk about that. You know, you said a body is for someone else. And that kind of hit, you know, and I think about that because some of the people that are tuned in um, maybe struggling to, you know, date again, or maybe struggling around intimacy with their partner. So, you know, can you give them some tips on how to overcome this? For sure. I think the first step is, is this great word. It starts with an M called masturbation, right? Like really getting connected to your body separate from anyone else. Um, and I'm hoping that you are already doing this pre being diagnosed, pre double mastectomy, pre any surgery, right? But so many of us were told that there's something wrong with touching your own body. Again, the messaging around your body belongs to someone else. And if you experience pleasure, it's supposed to come at the hands or at the sort of the fixing of someone else. And that is just not the case, right? So I hope you take the time to explore your body and what feels good for you. And honestly, it might not be masturbation right now. What you may need for pleasure is a nap right? You might need to eat a really delicious meal. You may need somebody else to make it for you, right? You may need like a really easy drive to get to work on a regular basis and it's stressful getting there. Maybe someone could do that for you once a week or every other week or once a month, right? So really exploring what feels good for you and honoring the ways in which pleasure um, shows up for you rather than ignoring it. And as Black folks, we are conditioned to ignore feeling good, right? That's why we have, you know, a lot of hashtags like um, Black Girl Joy or Black Boy Joy or Black Joy, period, because it's a reminder that we get to sit in pleasure. Um, so I invite folks to, as you get familiar with your body as it changes, right? That you masturbate, right? You invite yourself to do that. Look at your body newly in the, the mirror. Uh, taking selfies is such a great practice. You don't have to share it with anybody, right? They could just be for you. So you can put them in a little folder. So whenever somebody goes to scroll in your camera for no reason, maybe they don't pop up on it, um, but they are just yours for yourself. But then also looking at what are other ways you want your body honored? Is it not having to navigate health insurance, right? Because health insurance historically and present day is an incredibly anti-Black structure, right? Can somebody else navigate that on your behalf? That is pleasurable, right? So really getting present to all the ways that you can experience pleasure. And then that will only trickle into any sort of romantic or intimate relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stevenson, you're going to chime in? Yeah, I want to piggyback off okay. that because this idea of being comfortable with your body, again, that means touching your body. So when I'm seeing patients for non-breast cancer reasons, I always ask them, do you touch your breasts? Because it just might save your life. But for some reason, because people are not comfortable mm -hmm. touching themselves, they, how do you not know your body? You've been with yourself your whole life. You've never used a mirror to look down to at least know what your anatomy looks like. Call it a vagina. Don't call it a purse. Call it what it is. That is not a cuss word. It's not a bad word. It really is about getting to know your body. And I truly do believe once you get to know your body, you will find the beauty in it. Like our bodies are incredible. And the joke that I use on patients, so I'll see breast reduction patients all the time. I ask them, do you do your own self breast examinations? And it's, and it's not uncommon that a lot of breast cancer patients are diagnosed by their partners because their partners are touching their breasts. So how would somebody else know what your breast feels like and you don't? That is a part of knowing yourself and loving yourself. And again, black people, it's so taboo 
like Erica was saying, masturbation, getting to know your body. Nobody is with you more than you. So that is such an important concept. Yeah. And Erica, you know, you talked about being Black and the disparities around that. And then the extra layer is not only being a Black female, but also, or being looked at as a Black female, rather and then being a queer right so how do you how did you like overcome those challenges with all of those disparities kind of coming your way you know you 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 indicated you felt like you were kind of pushed out of the conversation you're in the room but you're kind of pushed out of the conversation so how did you handle those two elements of disparities it was thank you for that question it was really challenging um i remember going to a chemo appointment and my partner at the time was there and we were kind of just like sitting, I was sitting on her lap um, and while I was getting chemo and nurses kept walking by and they kept looking at us. And I was like, why are they looking at us? Like they've already done chemo. They've already done all the things. Like they know that I'll be here for like the next two and a half hours. Like what, what is going on? And then it clicked like, oh, I know what's happening. And I live in New York city. So a lot of people are like, well, New York City is super affirming and super queer friendly and no, still in, you know, many spaces, homophobia is still very present, transphobia is still very present, queerphobia is still present. So it was really, really challenging. And then also in, you know, just in breast cancer spaces, there was a lot of talk about, you know, husbands and kids, and there just weren't a lot of people around me talking about queerness. Um, and then I started to work with the LGBTQ cancer, um, organization. I think they're called, they were called the cancer group and now they're the org and that helped me a lot. But then I also just inserted myself in conversations, um, and reminding folks that not everybody relates to these things on their chest as breast. Some folks relate to it as their chest, right? And it's important, you know, even for medical providers to ask, how people want them named um, because it may be triggering and it could incite any sort of gender dysphoria if it's just assumed that they're called one thing. So I just started to insert myself in the conversation and do a lot of educating and advocacy on behalf of queer and trans and non-binary folks. Yeah. You talked about some of the ways about, you know, how health educators can be more supportive, you know? So what are some other things that you think that they could do um, to really be supportive of patients who maybe, you know, can identify themselves as queer or may not call their breast um, as breast? What are some other things that they could do to be supportive of those patients? Uh, well, of doctors, what the medical providers can do? Yes. I think just, you know, what, what we're dealing with with medical providers and medical institutions is the medical model of disability where there's the individual and then that all that matters about that individual is their illness and that's it. It doesn't matter their relationship. It doesn't matter their class status. It doesn't matter their race. It doesn't matter their age. It doesn't matter their sexual identity. It, it doesn't matter if they ate that morning, right? Like it's just not a holistic model and it's, it's a business right? When I see my oncologist, I am in there for maybe 25 minutes, right? And it's just quick, 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 like next person, next person, next person, who's next, who's next, like they are moving very fast. And I think that model has to go away, right? Like people really need time to sit and process and to think and to consider the questions that they have. And the doctor to be like, hey, how's your partner doing? Are, are you trying to get pregnant or are you dating somebody new or how's your relationship to your body? How's that going? Can I stand in here while you look at yourself in the mirror? Like that is, you know, just a few examples of holistic care that would make such a difference, right? When was the last time you took a nap, right? That's important to your rest, right? And to contributing to your health overall, right? Not just my vitamin D levels. Right. Also, have I taken a nap today? <laughs> yeah. So those are just a few that I would think would make a difference for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I always say, you know, in your speaking on this is we have to see people as people and not people as patients. 
And when we stop seeing them as patients and see them as people, then we can treat them better. Right? That's right. Absolutely. So Dr. Stevenson, you talked about this act regarding our breasts. Can you get into, or whatever we want to call them, right, Erica? Um, can you get into sharing with us, does this also apply to Medicare? Everything. The act that you spoke about. Everything. Everything. If you want something next week, you want it in 15 years, 99 years, it still applies. There is no expiration date on when you can have something done or something corrected when it comes to your breasts or your chest. And does it, oh, go ahead. You were going to say something? No, and it's not cosmetic. Now, does that also include if a person has had um, a lumpectomy or maybe possibly, you know, radiation where one breast is smaller yes. than the other? Everything. Awesome. And I will share, um, I recently saw a woman who had a lumpectomy and radiation and to just the right breast, and she wanted to have more symmetry. And the scar that she had, she was like, no, she's like, I really just want the other side matched to the side where I had a lumpectomy because otherwise she had good shape, everything. And I asked her, I said, well, did you want the scar revised? And she literally got choked up right there. And she said, I've been thinking and going back and forth, thinking it would just be cosmetic and that I should just be happy I don't have cancer. She's like, yeah, that I can do that. Yes, it is not cosmetic. And the reason why I stressed what plastic surgery is, is because there's so many people that are held back from pursuing the restoration that they want and need because they're like, oh, it's cosmetic, so it's not important. And I really think that's something we need to like trash altogether. This fact that you're always gonna have a reminder that you have breast cancer. The one thing you have control over is your reconstruction <laughs> of addressing whatever things don't look right to you or feel right. That's the one thing you have control over that you can address. Um, and again, just as Erica was saying, if you're experiencing it, like with hormonal therapy, I try to encourage all my patients to say, if you don't need, if you don't bring it up to anybody else, bring it up with me in my office, because there is a reason you're having that. And a lot of people only need validation that what they're concerned with is like, is valid. And a lot of times you don't have people taking the time to do that, or you haven't asked the right person. Again, if anything, if anything, talk to a plastic surgeon. Somebody's going to lead you in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're talking about body positivity. And one of the things that we know um, that happens to Black women is that we keloid. Um, you know, what are some things that people can do to address this issue around keloids? So there are um, ways to address it. I tell patients that there is no cure for keloids. Like have the expectation that it's gonna come back 100%, okay? Um, the first thing that um, kind of first line of treatment is to, excuse me, is to inject it with steroids. Okay, that may be something you need to do maybe once. Um, you might have to have it done, you know, on the regular, like every four to six months. Whenever your symptoms of itching start to come back, you have to get it injected again. There are some um, protocols with radiation, like a radiation oncologist, where you can have it treated, it's lower dose radiation. Um, but again, everybody responds differently. 
And basically a keloid is a benign tumor. That's the way I think of it. And that's the way I explain it. Have the expectation that it's going to come back. If it doesn't, great. <laughs> but always think that it might be something that, again, if you nick yourself, you get an ingrown hair or something like that, they can come back. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the different breast implant options? Like as someone describes it, the saline versus the gummy bear versus the silicone. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so... There's saline and there's silicone. When I talk about silicone implants, the example I like to use when, when you're making Jello, okay? When silicone implants came out, like in the 50s, 60s, it was like the liquid water, okay? The implants that you have now, more in the range of when it's starting to become solidified, it's kind of like jelly or jam or preserves to that solid block. That solid block is the gummy bear implant. Okay. That solid block means that if I have the implant in front of me and I cut it in half, it's just going to sit there. It's not going anywhere. The implants that are more in that liquidy, but it's starting to form, um, they have gotten into a place where if you cut the implant, it will start to move, but it's not like water. It's more stuck together. Um, the pros and cons to saline versus silicone. So saline, the shell is still silicone. So a lot of people will say, oh, I want saline because it doesn't have silicone in it. Saline still has silicone in it. It's the shell. It's the balloon that the saline is going to go in. Um, saline is heavier than silicone. So for any uh, people that had the tissue expanders, it's like having rocks on your chest. Saline is heavier than silicone. Um, sometimes you can hear it sloshing around. You can have some rippling depending on how thick the skin flaps are after the mastectomy. Um, you can see more rippling with saline implants, um, but if a saline implant ruptures, you're gonna be flat on one side, so we're gonna know, okay? With silicone, it's softer, feels more like breast tissue, um, less rippling, um, it's lighter, and if it ruptures, again, depending on where you are in that spectrum, um, with that gummy bear implant, because it's that solid block, it's going to be a lot more firm to the touch, like almost like a harder breast compared to the ones that are in that kind of, it's starting to, it's starting to form. They took the textured implants off the market, um, particularly from a particular, uh, company Allergan because they were noticing that anaplastic large cell lymphoma, people may have seen it as the breast implant associated cancer. Um, it had to do with their technique for texturizing the implants. Um, any person that had smooth implants that had that breast implant associated uh, cancer, they had a history of having the textured implants from that company. So all textured implants are off the market right now. Um, it's only smooth implants. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, since you talked about the breast implant illness is what most people have called it, mm -hmm. um, can you talk about infections? You know, this is a big thing that we hear about is, you know, what per percentage of or what's the risk when it comes to infections with like tissue expanders? And then as a follow-up, you know, when we talk about sepsis, you know, sometimes we hear patients or women or people who have gone through this journey and have reconstruction experience sepsis. So can you talk about that and how we could possibly minimize sepsis? Mm. So there are a lot of factors that go into that. So 
if you are, you know, if you're somebody that had chemotherapy before your mastectomies and the reconstruction, you know, usually we time out when the uh, mastectomies and the reconstruction is going to be done with regards to the chemotherapy. So there's also, you know, having said that, there's the concern that your immune system may not be quite uh, up to fighting some infections. Um, typically, plastic surgeons are pretty meticulous about um, making sure that we reduce the risk of infection when we place a tissue expander or we place an implant. But obviously, you know, your skin has bacteria on it. It could be any of those little things that could get on the um, tissue expander or the implant. Because it's a foreign body, it doesn't have circulation. And when things don't have circulation, the immune system can't get to it to fight the infection. So there's a low risk of infection, but again, if patients have a history of resistant bacterial infections, so MRSA, that methicillin resistant staph infection, um, there are certain bacteria that we try to cover and actually we rinse the tissue expanders and the implants in antibiotics just to make sure that we're getting away all the bacteria. Um, but again, sometimes there are just really bad situations where even though we do all of those things to prevent infections, they still occur. Um, it's always frustrating when you have to take out the tissue expander or the implant wait for everything to resolve to start all the way over again. Because again, it feels like a setback. Yeah. And speaking of setbacks, Erica, can you talk more a little bit about, you know, we talked about intimacy. Yeah. We're seeing issues around libido. What can people do to boost their libido? Uh, you can do some things to boost your libido. What could you do to boost your libido? Um, one is to schedule some sexy time. Uh, schedule some time that actually works for you to, you know, kind of not think about work, not think about health insurance, not think about a diagnosis, um, but just time for you or a partner um, and to be intentionally, you know, intimate. Again, that might look like taking a bath, right? Taking a bubble bath, maybe adding some magnesium to it, maybe adding, I don't know, any sort of bath salt that tickles your fancy, um, it might like it might look like taking a really hot shower, getting out and rubbing shea butter all over yourself and jumping into some really clean sheets. Right. Like whatever it means, but setting the time um, to actually do that, because oftentimes what will lower our libido is stress. So looking for ways to reduce stress, but also what could lower our libido is just not making time um, for our sexual health. So actually making the time is my biggest suggestion is, is, is and it lowering, you know, stress as much as possible. The fresh sheets are just like, it's, it's so arousing. <laughs> so, you know, you talk about doing all of these things and we're really trying to address the body positivity in this segment. And, you know, how do we handle situations when we build up the courage, we get the nerve to go out there, we date and we do all of these things, but then we get rejected. What are some things you can share with us to help us deal with those issues? Um, it's such a good question. I once, when I first started um, dating after my divorce, I sent somebody who sent me a nude, right? They sent me a nude. So I returned like a little nude selfie. And it was like my, it was cute too. It was like angle cute and everything. And they stopped talking to me. <laughs> and my heart was crushed. I was crushed. Like it, it, I mean, who knows what went through their head? Like I never said that I was a breast cancer survivor or anything. I just sent the selfie, right? But I don't need to explain that I've had breast cancer or anything to be, you know, uh, adored and sexualized and wanting to, you know, folks to be with me. I shouldn't have to do that. But they just stopped talking to me. So it was so painful. So I love this question. And, you know, it was so important for me to weed folks like that out. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it was a blessing that they just ghosted me because I don't want to be with somebody who would have did maybe something harmful like that in person. 
right? We had the space of a cell phone and whatever, you know, miles of distance, wherever they lived. Um, if they were in the, like, in my space, it probably would have felt a bit worse. And I think if that has happened to you, again, it is information to not have those folks in your life, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody that's questioning your body, um, any part of your body, right? Your blackness, um, your butt, your breast, your lips, your eyes, your hair, right? Any of that is questioned. It's time for them to kick it to the curb. And I, I'm, I really say that across the board, not just intimate relationships. It's important. Even your friends and your familial relationships really um, actually lift you up and celebrate how you look just as you are. Um, that's super important to have folks really love on you when you are in a bonnet in a robe. You know what I mean? You don't have to do the most um, to be seen as hella fine and just perfect the way you are. So I think just remembering that that you are weeding folks out and you're going to surround people with, you know, surround yourself with people who actually adore you. Um, and we are not out here. Um, we don't need to be we can be picky. You know what I mean? Like, we can really be intentional around who's around us. I think sometimes, again, we inherit the thoughts around being desexualized and begin to think, well, this is the best that I can do. Can I curse? Can you curse? <laughs> F that. F that. F that. You know we'll what I mean? That way. F that. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, don't just take rejection as information. It's a part of the game. Take it as information. Yeah. Thank you, Erica. And I think that's really important, you know, because oftentimes, especially, you know, when we're young and we're single, I just think back to when I was diagnosed, the challenges that I had, and I just had a lumpectomy, but I still was challenged with seeing my scars, you know, mm -hmm. and showing the scars. And so like when you went through your surgery and you woke up after your surgery, when you had to have that first moment of looking at yourself in the mirror, like how did you become comfortable with the body changes? What are the things that you personally did? I know you gave us a lot of tips, but what are some of the things that you personally did to really help you deal with that when you had to first look at yourself and become comfortable with looking at yourself? To be completely honest, I honored the breasts that were on my chest for, I don't know, what is that, like 13 years or something? I went to the beach with all of my friends the two or three days before my double mastectomy. And I wore tassels over my nipples. And there's a video of me like shaking my boobs like in a circle because I used to be able to do that. I wonder if I could do that now with these, <laughs> probably not. Um, Dr. Stevenson, I need to see you to be able to move my muscles in that way again. Um, but it was just a way to celebrate my body. I tried to put my former breasts in a cast to save them. You know how people do the belly cast? Mm -hmm. It failed. It was just blue crap all over the bathroom. But the memory was so beautiful that that is the way that I got to honor, you know, the breasts that have been on my chest. Honestly, 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 I wasn't so attached to the aesthetic. I was more so just so happy that cancer was out of my body. Like, I just did not want to have that. And when my breast cancer surgeon was like, you need to have a double mastectomy, I was, you know, shocked because that was my first ever surgery. But I was more so like, whatever has to happen, so this goes away, then fine. Uh, and then I think what now, what, what became challenging for me were the tissue expanders and wearing tight shirts and seeing the shape. Um, and being uncomfortable thinking that people were going to point out the shape or people were going to look at it weird. And then just remembering that people are going to think whatever they think, regardless, they may just be like, that color is not good on you, right? They may not ever be looking at my chest at all, but just to remember that I get to be here, I get to be present, I get to wear whatever the hell I want um, and exist in my body, um, however it feels good to me. And if it's really hot, and I want to wear a tight shirt, I'm going to wear a tight shirt, right? Like, I'm just going to do that for myself rather than covering myself up and sweating more because I'm worried about, you know, how my body may be perceived. So those are the things that I just start to tell myself, like, please just, it's time to let this go. But also therapy was like such a space for me to really talk about 
all of the grief that I had around my body. Now, as somebody who's trying to get pregnant, um, I've had a lot of grief around not being able to breastfeed. And when I was 28 and diagnosed, I wasn't really thinking about babies at the time. And now I am. So now it's challenging. So I'm, I'm working on that in therapy um, to the fact that I will never be able, I could potentially do that. I could chest feed. There's ways to make that happen, but not in the ways that I have been, you know, conditioned or how I dreamt about it um, will never happen. So it's, I, I think relating to it as grief helps a lot too, and not diminishing it to, um, it's not, it's not a way to diminish, but I think to really relate to this as trauma, right. And to relate to it as something that you once experienced, you experienced was well, something that you once had, maybe something that you once dreamt of, maybe you wanted to wear a particular outfit and imagine yourself in that outfit in a particular way. That is, that's, that's important. Right. And it should be held as such. And I think that was a, a healing process for me to not negate or minimize how I was feeling um, about pretty much anything. Um, and that's what I try to do moving forward, even though it's hard for me um, as a black femme, you know, like we've been talking about already, we are conditioned to just kind of accept what we're given and just be thankful and be happy to be here and continue to hold space for people all the time without getting any space help for us. And it was just important for me to, you know, really center myself at this time. That has been the lesson, I think, throughout all of this is like, how can I be selfish, right? What does that look like? Um, the selfish look like wearing something and not thinking about anybody's thoughts on it, right? The selfish look like, I don't know, um, going topless and all over New York City. <laughs> with billboards all over and not giving, you know, not caring at all about that, right? The, with the being seen, really, really putting myself in the conversation to be seen um, as desirable, but also to be seen as here, like literally present. Um, yeah, that's, that's like a tangent I feel like I went on, but I hope I answered the question. <laughs> no, you did. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and Dr. Stevenson, I want to get back to the coverage because we're having a lot of questions that are coming in around coverage. You know, when we go through reconstruction, if, you know, when we look at our breasts and, and see that, you know, maybe we want to go back to the same size that we were, maybe we want to go a little bit larger, like, are those things covered? Can we go um, larger or can we go smaller or can we remain the same? What does that look like for us? So, yes, you can. Um, sometimes you have to, um, you very well may need to appeal sometimes, but again, should be covered. <laughs> um, I've had patients that have wanted to, uh, initially start with implant-based reconstruction or start with using their own tissue and for whatever reason, again, all the factors I had named before as to reasons why using your own tissue may not be an option or they may fail. So if you're doing that um, surgery where we're taking the tissue from the abdomen, excuse me, <clears throat> from the abdomen and disconnecting the blood vessels and suturing them or connecting them with blood vessels in the chest, there's a risk that that just won't be successful. And so now that option is off the table, even though we've attempted it. Um, insurance still cover that. Um, they may give you a little pushback, <clears throat> but you have the right person advocating for you or you advocating for yourself. Anytime they send a denial, they will send also information about an appeal. Um, you can personally write that appeal yourself and talk to your plastic surgeon. If for some reason you're getting pushback from that person, find somebody else. One of the things about healthcare right now is that people think whatever they are told by their provider is like, is it. Um, 
just as you would have anybody else in your circle of people, you and your doctor need to get along. You need to be on the same page. Not everybody's for everybody. Okay. I have some people that are like, you know, I want the best, you know, I don't care how rude they are, but if that affects how you communicate with each other, you need to find somebody else. And that's just as important. You need to be able to have a relationship with them where you can be honest and that you know that they've got your back and they're going to advocate for you in the best way possible. So looking around for a different um, healthcare provider is not a problem. And it's encouraged. I see people on a daily basis, I'm going through their health, their health information. And they're like, you know, I ask a question and I'm like, so have you gotten a diagnosis? Like, do we know why this is happening? How long have you been having this issue? They're like, no, you know, they just said, that's just how it is. I encourage you to seek a second opinion. Like empowering people to seek a second opinion. Like, that's absolutely fine. Don't feel, don't feel bad about hurting anybody's feelings. You are entitled to a second opinion, a third opinion. Now, if you're, going to, if you're going to all these people and they're pretty much saying the same thing, like it's not varying, then perhaps <laughs> that probably is the options that you have. But do not feel bad about finding the right person for you. Um, so again, go, again, going back to those types of procedures being covered, they should be covered. And if you are, if you're with somebody that's not wanting to appeal and work on your behalf and be your advocate, then you need to look elsewhere. Yeah. So what are some options that people may have that are teetering and, and just really on the fence with their options, what they want to do, they may have the option to do whatever, whether it's a lumpectomy or mastectomy, and they may have some concerns about, you know, losing their nipples or what have you. What are some options that they can have? Because of course, we know that once you have a mastectomy, of course, it's irreversible. Is there mm -hmm. anything that they can do, perhaps have a lump lumpectomy with some reconstruction and then go back and have uh, a mastectomy? Like, what does that look like where they can actually be able to keep their nipples? Yeah. So I've actually, I um, have had several patients that are not only gene positive and they have a risk for developing breast cancer, but then also patients that have breast cancer and are being treated for their cancer, where they've had large breasts that if we were just doing a mastectomy, the nipples would not survive, but they really want to keep their nipples. Um, I've done a breast reduction. At the time of the breast reduction, the breast surgeon does a lumpectomy to remove the cancer. But anytime you do a lumpectomy, you got to have radiation. So they get radiation on that side. Um, we wait to see how things settle with the radiation because the radiation basically fries the tissue. And what you have is it starts to shrink down a little bit. So it's not gonna be as supple and mobile as the untreated side. Um, but again, we're doing that so that we can hopefully preserve the nipple and areola. Then after about, usually the literature says between six to nine months, you can go forward with the mastectomy where we're removing the tissue and then, you know, put the tissue expanders in. And usually if we're doing that kind of reconstruction where we're trying to save the nipples, we want to put the tissue expanders in because they're kind of there to make sure the nipples are going to do okay. If we need to, we don't want to do any final reconstruction, even if we've got them down to a small size there is a size limit where you can, you know, put in the permanent implant or using your own tissue to fill the inside of that pocket to reconstruct the breast mound. Anytime you're doing those staged procedures, the concern is that the circulation to the nipple and the areola hasn't quite um, established itself and that that nipple can die. So there are ways that you can stage these procedures. Um, again, that is a discussion to be had. 
because you have to weigh the risks and the benefits. If you have a really aggressive cancer, um, you know, patient autonomy, that is a real thing and should be respected. It, but you have to give that information. People need to be informed about what their actual options are. If someone is willing to, you know, weigh those risks and benefits and still want to proceed with that, again, this is like the one thing you have a choice about, you have, you have control over. Knowing that information and the risks involved, let's do it. Absolutely. Well, we are running out of time. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you so much, Dr. Stevenson. This has been great. So last question. If you could leave the audience with one parting word or one takeaway, um, we've talked about reconstruction, we've talked about body image, body positivity, what would that be? And I'll start with you, Erica. Oh, gosh, you put me on the spot. Um, you are more than your body um, and honor your body. Um, honor your boundaries, um, set your boundaries, get to people in your life who actually support you and check in on you and ask questions about you um, and masturbate. <laughs> All right, Dr. Stevenson. Thank you, Erica. Um, I would, I would probably say that you matter. Um, there's a whole range of emotions and it's a roller coaster. Some days are better than the other. Um, but whatever you're feeling and thinking about yourself and the whole process, it matters. Do not diminish it and write it off as looking at the person next to you. Well, I'm not, you know, well, I'm not that bad. Or, you know, mine's, I, I should, I, you're diminishing what you're going through by comparing to somebody else. You matter and your feelings and your experience throughout the whole process matters. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much, Erica. And thank you so much, Dr. Stevenson, for a great program tonight. Right.